Welcome to Paul or Nothing, the place to get all of your Paul all of the time. Join me, your host Sam Wiles, as we discover the history, the music, and the man behind it all, Paul McCartney. To get in contact with the show, email us at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. Guten Tag, and welcome to another bonus episode of Paul or Nothing, where I once again will be delaying the completion of another proper episode to indulge in some Beatles chat with the man who's undoubtedly a Beatles expert of the highest calibre. I first became aware of Aaron Kadervich when trawling through YouTube on one of those endless binges of Beatles clips and interviews, when I suddenly spotted a thumbnail image for something called The Beatles Minute. Now, this is a show on YouTube that does exactly as advertised, exactly what it says on the tin, and each episode, which is always just over a minute long if you include the opening titles, there is a consistently interesting and insightful analytical nugget into a particular moment or movement within a Beatles song. Topics may cover how George Harrison borrowed the bass line from Otis Redding's Respect, the splice between the alternate Strawberry Fields, Take 7 and Take 26, or how the ghost of Eleanor Rigby may live on or not live on through the harmonies. The moment that I discovered this show existed and that its creator could be contacted through the medium of Twitter, this episode was destined to take place, as it's increasingly rare as a modern Beatles fan who's you know, read all the books to have new content to, to devour, and Aaron's stuff is always a tasty morsel indeed. Aaron's bread and butter are his lectures and talks uh, on a wide variety of Beatles topics, and he performs them at a wide variety of universities and societies both across the US and the UK. I was about to tell you where you could go and find a short example of one of these lectures, but as you will see in the episode, I actually bring it up and shock Aaron by telling him that one of his lectures was on YouTube, as it's a clear breach of his copyright. Can't wait to see what happens with that one. Aaron has also put out several books on the Beatles, which only goes to further show the scope and breadth of his knowledge. We have From the Shadow of JFK, The Rise of Beatlemania in America, where he muses over the cultural vacuum left by the assassination of Kennedy, which may have allowed the Beatles to flourish in the States in the first place. There's The Beatles and the Avant-Garde, which pretty much speaks for itself, which we also touch on in the interview. Then we have one which kind of caught my eye, which is Days in the Life, which catalogues Aaron's travels around America with his father whilst doing his Beatles lecture circuit and they pretty much discuss everything from Beatles life and the universe. You can purchase all of these books from your favourite online book sites, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, or even directly from his website which is www.aaronkadervich.com. I will be spelling the word Kadervich in all the medium that I put out for, for this episode, don't worry I'm not going to uh, expect you to spell Kadervich on your own and I'm sure he wouldn't either. Now before we start we will as always have to do a little bit of spring cleaning. Where are these emails, folks? Why are you not emailing paulmccartneypod at gmail.com to tell me how good this show is? Do you have a favourite album? Do you have a least favourite album? Do you prefer Paul in the Beatles? Do you prefer his solo stuff? Are you a defender of wings like I am? Do you like mumbo? Do you play an instrument? Have you met Paul? Did you see the Beatles live? Anything to do with Paul McCartney or the Beatles or you just want to say hello or you just want to rub my ego? Please send an email to paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. You can also join us on the Twitter, which is at McCartneyPod. I might be setting up uh, an Instagram and a Facebook just to cover the whole gamut of the social media circuit. There's also the blog. Articles are actually now being written. They're not just a pipe dream. Uh, you can also find all the episodes there uh, as sort of like a little nexus of all the of all things Paul or Nothing, which is paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com. Please leave us an iTunes review. Like I say, every episode, they're the best way to help out the show. You know you want to give us five stars. Just give us a quick click. Merch will also be on the way. Uh, after I finish recording this intro, I'm going to see my good friend Danny, who designed the misspelled thumbnail for this podcast. Uh, he also did the thumbnails for, uh, for Down in the Hole, as well as the merchandise for that, which we actually do sell from time to time. And I'll be doing the same the same thing for this most because Paul McCartney stuff will sell whether they know it's related to this podcast or not. Also, please check out my appearance on the See Here podcast. About two weeks ago, I appeared on the See Here podcast with my good friend Maurice, and we discussed the movie and the, the cultural legacy of Yellow Submarine. So if you'd like to see me branching out, making my way into the wider world of podcasting, then please check that out. Just type in See and Hear. That's not H-E-R-E, -E, that's H-E-A-R. See here. It's a fantastic podcast, and even if even if you didn't know I was on it, I'd highly recommend it anyway. 
Now, there's one thing I will say before the interview starts. Um, I ask Aaron about an hour in what he thinks is the greatest musical, technological leap between any two Beatles albums. And when you have so much Beatles trivia buzzing around your head and you're live on air, things can come out a little bit garbled. And when he says, from Beatles for sale to Rubber Soul, what he actually means is from help to Rubber Soul, which is exactly what I would have said if I'd been asked the same question. Now, I was going to remove it, but... And Aaron, if you're listening, I, I really hope you agree with me here. The place the conversation goes from that point and the flow of the chit-chat was just too good to cut for me and I couldn't leave it on the cutting room floor. So people don't go too harsh on him, okay? He's only human. Now, without further ado, let's cut to the live feed. Take it away, me. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the live section of the show. Welcome, welcome to Paul or Nothing. You've probably just come back from my wonderfully concise and complimentary introduction to my guest here today. This is another bonus episode. Obviously, this is where we do our interviews. My guest here today, as I'm sure I've probably just mentioned, is Aaron Kadervich. Hello, Aaron. How are you today, my friend? Oh, I'm excellent. Thank you so much for uh, for chatting. No, it's all right. I mean, doing this show, uh, obviously, most of the um, actual ep episodes where I to discuss the albums, I'm on my own, so it's always nice uh -huh. to uh, get some good Beatles chat in wherever I can. This is also the first episode where we're not really going to be focusing on Paul specifically, but just Beatles, all things Beatles, Paul, all of it. You know, let's let, let's just have a nice chat. Uh, yeah. First question, Aaron. Yeah. I feel that when people know that you're into a specific thing, and I think we can guess what your specific thing is, they can uh -huh. tend to over rely on it around the festive period. So tell me, did you get any Beatles stuff for Christmas? <laughs> I did. In fact, uh, the the new book uh, Lennon on Lennon, uh, you know, transcripts of interviews with John Lennon. My grandma bought me that for Christmas Aww. this year. So it's it's the newest addition to my already jam packed Beatles bookshelf. Do you have a Beatles room, or is it just spread around your house? Yeah, I do. I've, I've got. Uh, I'm, I'm essentially self-employed, so my, my home office is, is uh, where I, where I do a lot of my writing, and I, I book a lot of my speaking engagements. So I'm, I've, I've got to, uh, to my, to my left of the computer, I've got two rather large bookshelves that are crammed full of Beatles stuff, and then uh, around, I've got like posters and things hanging on the wall. I've got a couple of jigsaw puzzles, like a Bambi Road. <laughs> so uh, a lot of. A lot of stuff. Not uh, I, I'm not much of a collector, but what I do collect, I, I keep here in my office. Have you got your sights on the uh, new Lego Yellow Submarine? It looks pretty cool. It, it, it does, but you know, I went to a conference at Penn State Altoona in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, back in 2014. It was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the band's debut on Ed Sullivan. Oh, and yeah. while I was there, uh, I saw a custom-made lego yellow submarine so before it was a thing before it, it came out as like an actual lego um thing that you could buy someone had had invented their own lego oh, yellow submarine and yeah. so at this conference i i splurged i spent forty dollars but i really like it and it's currently sitting on top of uh of, of bookshelf number one to my left here oh, fantastic does it have a little jeremy because that's the uh, unique feature of the new one you get, you get i'm afraid jeremy it does thing. not have a jeremy no oh, pity so, but I'm, I'm quite fond of it. <laughs> I'm very glad. I've got my eyes on it myself for my next paycheck. Yeah. So it's safe to say we're both fans of the Beatles. Do it. Definitely. And with friends and close acquaintances of mine, it's always a joy when they turn out to be Beatle heads too. And mm -hmm. the best part of, of that is discussing kind of the basic fundamentals, the questions that shape how you view the other's love of the band. There's nothing uh -huh. better than when someone says, let it be is better than Sgt. Pepper, and you get a nine-hour <laughs> debate about it. So, right. for the sake of speed, I'm going to quickly assess you and ask you the basics, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, shoot. Sure. This is going to be a quick, uh, quick fire round. Okay. Is there ever a time when you don't remember the Beatles in your life? No. What was the first Beatles album you listened to, start to finish? Oh, I can't even remember. The way I was exposed to the band was through my dad, and he would uh, make his little mixtapes. He would oh. take all his favorites and um, put them in his own ordering. Uh, so those are th that's what I first heard. The, the actual Beatles, first Beatles album might have been A Hard Day's Night. Mm. Uh, I think I was in grad school when uh, the 2009 remastered CDs came out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was already very familiar with the Beatles and their music and very appreciative of, of their output. Um, but that I think that's probably the first time that I actually uh, where I actually listened to an album beginning to end because before that it was all you know my dad's uh, my dad's tapes that uh, that I grew up with. Yeah, Revolver for me was the first album ever 
that I sat down yeah. and listened to in one sitting the whole way through. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's it's a real through the looking glass moment. You can't you can't go back once you've done that. Right. What is the Beatles album you listen to the most? Oh, probably Abbey Road. That one's that one's got to be my favorite. I think that's uh, that's the Beatles at their pinnacle. It is it is a popular one, isn't it? There there isn't really a dud on there, though. Uh, controversially, I'm not a big Sun King fan. I think it's a bit of a really <laughs> compared to the rest of the medley, especially yeah. where Mean uh, Mean Mr Mustard and, and Polythene mm-hmm. Pan follow. I think mm-hmm. it's a bit of a an unnecessary lull, but you know, it, okay. it, it, it is what it is. So you, you'd put Sun King, you, you'd put um, Maxwell Silver Hammer ahead of Sun King? Um, I, I love Paul's terrible granny music. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm very anti-Lennon in that, but we'll, we'll uh, come Great. on to that later. We'll come on to that later. What album do you listen to the least? Hmm. You know, I know this is sacrilegious because so many people love Rubber Soul, <gasps> but of all the Beatles albums, that's my least favorite. Rubber Soul! Yeah, I'm tempted to end this podcast now. I think I, I don't think we can we can connect on any. That, that's that's level. game over. Yeah, girl in my life. Oh my god. Well, in, in my life might might be my. It has to be in my top five. So I, I think it's got moments of brilliance. But as an album, I, I know people love it, and apparently you do too. You like it but, more than uh, Beatles for Sale. You, you know, I think Beatles for Sale is one of the more important albums. Not because it's a particularly great album, but because it really shows uh, their their progress and how how they, they kind of got tired of, of fame and they have to rely more on cover songs on Beatles for Sale. On Hard Day's Night, they didn't have any cover songs. It's all Lennon-McCartney originals. So I, I think Beatles for Sale is underrated in its importance in the band's history and their development even though I will admit that these songs, you know, the quality of songs is less than uh, than other other albums, Rubber Soul included, in that regard. What you're doing and uh, I'll Follow the Sun are two of McCartney's uh, best, in my in my opinion. Though he he he's very nice on that album because mm-hmm. it's it's nice as well because he pretty much had zero input on a Hard Day's Night, which is a very Lennon heavy album, obviously except for can't buy me love so it, it, and, and i love her and things we said today but oh but it is lennon heavy yeah. yeah yeah uh what is the most underrated beatles song hmm being for the benefit of mr kite oh fantastic I love that choice one. um frank sidebottom does a brilliant cover of it uh, as well actually oh really okay yeah. i haven't uh how, yeah. how do you spell that i don't know that name um did you see that film that came out a few years with, uh, ago with Michael Fassbender called Frank? It was it was based on um, so. he's, he's a very obscure kind of fake persona musician uh, with a very nasally voice, and he yeah. wore a paper mache head wherever he, he went, and no one knew what he looked like. A very aloof figure. Uh, yeah. If you just um, type in Frank and then the word side and then the word bottom as one word, you'll uh, be, able, be able to find a. A corpaconia of very weird music. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'm I, I like very weird music, so uh, I'm I'm very interested. Right. The last three. Favorite John Lennon song. Hmm. I am the Walrus. George Harrison. Tie between something and Here Comes the Sun. Oh, okay. Well, obviously you're a big a big Abbey Abbey Road fan. But I am indeed. Most importantly for this show in particular. Yep. What's your favorite Paul McCartney song? Uh, do you count the Abbey Road medley yes, as yes, Paul's yes. song? Then that's it. Yes. Um, obviously, he didn't achieve the same success on when he did the same thing again on Red Rose Speedway. But when you when you go back to that medley, it's mm. it's staggeringly efficient. It's it, it blends so perfectly. Yeah, I I, I really think that's uh, that's that's the Beatles at the peak of their musical prowess. But it's funny though because they were barely in the studio at the same time so it just it, it just shows how well they could make an album and and how they used the studio to to produce you know, as opposed to the early years where it was it was like recreating a live show yes now before we go any further both for yeah. your discretion and for the listeners i very much like paul himself cannot read music i do not yeah. understand music on a technical level nor do i know any of the terminology so bear right. all that in mind and for the benefit of the people at home what exactly is a beatles scholar and can you explain your background in music of course, yes. That's a question I get a lot. Um, and and my my background, I, I did a, a bachelor's of music and theory and composition at Butler University in Indianapolis. 
I then did a master's in music composition at Boston University in Massachusetts. And then I started a doctoral program at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. But I never did finish it. Part of the reason uh, was because while I was there, I got really into the Beatles. So my, my background is as a, as a classical um, you know, academic. And, and, and so when I started this doctoral program, I started to get away from classical academia and more into pop music. And essentially what I do, what I mean when I call myself a Beatles scholar, is that I conduct academic musical analysis, but I use these classical analytic techniques and I apply them to a popular music context. Mm -hmm. So the things I learned studying Beethoven and Mozart and Bach, I use those same techniques, but in a very different musical genre, a different style. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was this grant you got as well to uh, study mm -hmm. the Beatles? Where did that come about? Sure, that was uh, in 2011, uh, which would have been my second year at the University of Hartford. Mm -hmm. I applied for and won a research grant through the university. Apparently, they had some, um, some extra uh, funds, and so they dispersed it to their graduate students. They said the, the university issued a statement that said um, to all the grad students, write up uh, grant proposals and submit them, and we'll fund as many as we can. So I uh, wrote up this grant to write a book called The Beatles and the Avant-Garde, which is looking a lot at the more experimental, the weird stuff, I think, as you, you worded it a few minutes ago, <laughs> and uh, looking a lot at Yoko Ono and how she changed, uh, how she changed the Beatles. Uh, so that, that grant was, was really to fund uh, a lot of research for that book, and I published that book a couple years later. It took me about three years to go through all of those those materials. I still haven't gone through all the materials, but I, to wade through it all and kind of digest it and um, uh, produce this, uh, this, this book, The Beatles and the Avant-Garde. So that was published November 2014, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, since then, I've expanded my, my scope and I've, I've gone to kind of all things Beatles, not just that one specific focus, uh, but looking a lot more uh, at, at the band and the phenomenon of Beatlemania uh, as a whole. So that, that grant, it was an academic grant to begin with, but I've taken it in a, in a more accessible, less academic way since then. Your other books cover like, a much wider variety of topics than right. I, I probably would have guessed at first. Do you feel like you wanted to cover elements of Beatle lore, Beatle history that had not yet been covered, or were you kind of forced to... <laughs> search further and wider because just so much has already been written on this band? Yeah, uh, more of the latter. So much has been written already and so much of it is really, really well done. In particular, Mark Lewison's books are just extraordinary. I use them every day. They're the gold standard of Beatles uh, history and, and biography. Uh, the one, so, so most of what I do is musical analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, most biographers, Lewison included, don't really touch on the, the musical side of things. Uh, because they're they're focused on history and and biography, and that makes perfect sense, and I love that. It's just not what I do. I analyze music because that's what I was trained to do in in college. So the one exception to that would be my second uh, uh, book, which is called "From the Shadow of JFK: The Rise of Beatlemania in America." And there's a, a popular notion that Kennedy's assassination helped spawn. Beatlemania in the United States, and the logic goes that Kennedy's death made the U.S. sad, and then the Beatles came along a few months later and made the nation happy again, and, and that accounts for why the band failed in the U.S. market in 1963, and then out of nowhere, seemingly, uh, skyrocketed to superstardom in early 1964. So I had read that uh, many times in many books by many authors, and I just never believed it. I, I always felt that it was overly simplistic. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it that that it was it was more historical coincidence than it was one thing caused the other. What changed my mind is when I started researching John Kennedy, because I did not grow up in uh, at at a time. I mean, Kennedy died a couple decades before I was born, so I have no personal experience. I had to rely on historical documentation, and I went through a couple miles of microfilm from the New York Times and the Washington Post. And I read a whole bunch of articles and transcripts of his speeches, and I read uh, several biographies, and I started to realize there is a connection. But it's not this emotional fallout. It's not Kennedy sad, Beatles happy. It's that both Kennedy and the Beatles were leaders of youth culture. Mm -hmm. And in the mid-20th century, youth culture was 
uh, blooming in a way that uh, that that adolescent um, that adolescence hadn't in decades and centuries prior. And so then I started to to think, you know, there there really is a connection here. And so my my book, From the Shadow of JFK: The Rise of Beatlemania in America, is looking at that connection. That book and my presentation of the same title uh, puts forth my argument for why there is indeed a connection but not that overly simplistic emotional fallout that so many others have done. So, yeah. Uh, you can get that um, lecture online on YouTube now, can't you? Uh, it's about an hour and a half long, is it? Uh, I don't think so. It's, I mean, not to my knowledge. Yeah, I don't think I, it's on well, YouTube. Because I'm pretty sure I've listened to it on YouTube, actually. Oh, interesting. Well, that's news to me. I, yeah. I had no idea. I'd, uh, I'd chase up that copyright claim pretty quick if I were you. <laughs> if I were you. Um, well, yeah, I, I certainly haven't uploaded because that does violate copy. For me, for me to do these presentations in person falls under fair use, but to reproduce it and upload it to YouTube like that is is a violation of copyright law, which is why I have not done that. So, um, you know, I, I I'm not responsible for any violations. I've been I have to be very careful because my whole career is based on this. So. Um, ah, here we go. It's, I, I know nothing about that. It was uploaded by the Avalon Free Library. I'm not sure who they are. Oh, okay. Yeah, I spoke there back in April of 2016, and I, I did the Kennedy program. Um, I had no idea that they were uploading it to YouTube, but technically that is illegal. So. Mm, I hope I haven't caused, uh, caused, caused some beef on air. Oh, God. Drama. Well, it's <laughs> I, I can't be held responsible if somebody else uploads yeah. any more than I could be responsible if I produced a CD and somebody copied it and put it on YouTube. I can't be held responsible for that. But it is something I take very seriously um, be, because I, I want to make sure that I, I only use copyrighted material under fair use provisions. No, I have that uh, on my show as well. Always mm -hmm. careful never to go over 20 seconds of music without talking right. o o over it because Apple will just come down on you like a, like a, like a ton of bricks, really. Um, uh -huh. What draws you to the lecturing format? Um, why, why do you feel like it's the best way to get it across to a large group of people? Uh, well, one major reason is is what we were just talking about, copyright law, because I can play under fair use provisions these clips in a face-to-face -face educational context, um, as opposed to creating a video um, or, or trying to upload to YouTube, you know, things like that would greatly expand my audience, but then there are all sorts of legal complications. So these face-to-face -face lectures that I do are a really good way to be able to, to play these clips and show these examples uh, and, and make my points, um, but without having the, the legal ramifications. I feel uh, I feel like you really need to get on a, a TED talk. I think that would really really give you the uh, the boost you might need because they because they would handle all all, all that copyright for you. Right, I would love to do a TED talk. Do you ever fear that through your obviously very extensive and thorough research that you risk over intellectualizing the band and their music? Uh -huh. Yeah, sometimes people ask me about that too. Uh, one of the common questions I get is, "So do you ever just listen to music?" <laughs> And uh, the short answer is not really, because um, I mean, my, my whole life for, for the last you know, like 20 years or so, I'm 31 now, and for the last like 20, 15 to 20 years, mm -hmm. I've tried very hard to uh, develop my ears, my, my analytical ears, and to the point now where oftentimes I don't even need a keyboard to figure out the chord progressions, because I'm, I'm just so, uh, I've, I've done it so much that I've, I've learned, I've trained myself to be able to analyze music uh, as I hear it. Now that being said, uh, I drive my wife crazy because every time we're in the car, I crank country music, which is not very sophisticated at all. In fact, that's kind of the point of, of uh, you know American country and western is that it's so uh, it's it's very simple. It's not trying to be uh, erudite or or sophisticated. It's trying to be uh, very very simple because that's uh, that's one of the defining characteristics of country music. So in that sense, yeah, I just listen to that for pleasure, just because I think it sounds good. I like it. It's nothing fancy, and it's not trying to be. So in that sense, I, I kind of listen without analytical ears. Uh, but at the same time, even there, I, I can't help but noticing, hey, that's the same chord progression as used in in this other song or whatever the case may be. So it, it, it's it's a difficult question to answer. Do I ever listen just for pleasure as opposed for analytical reasons? Because on one hand, 
Uh, no, I'm always analyzing whatever I'm listening to. But on the other hand, I would say that the analysis and the understanding that I've, I've developed and honed furthers my enjoyment. So it is listening for pleasure because I'm analyzing. And it, it makes it very difficult to, to give a straight answer. It's a really interesting question and a good question, but the answer is, is complicated because you can't do, I can't just say, yes, this is for pleasure, and no, you're whatever. It's, it's all of the above. Uh, and, and in many ways that enhances the pleasure listening. I totally understand where you're coming from because the podcast I did before this was uh, called Down in the Hole and it focused on the music of yeah. Tom Waits. Okay. And I burnt myself out pretty quickly with that. Uh, yeah. me, me and my co-host who uh, did it, he, uh -huh. we both re uh, come to the conclusion that we haven't listened to a, a full album since we actually left, left the show. Um, yeah. I actually bought a vinyl player today actually and um, I put on... Uh, the Black Rider, which is one of his more obscure uh, albums based based on a play, and it it was like meeting an old an old friend actually. And I, I hope I never do the same to Paul. But luckily, his uh, discography is so expansive that it's very hard to 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 retread and go over the same albums in that way. Do you feel like there's something that you get or conceive from a greater understanding of this music, like how it's built, that you simply cannot glean from just listening to the songs? I would say so, because, um, I, again, one of the questions that I'm frequently asked is, why the Beatles? You know, why don't you study other bands like Bob Dylan or you know, Elvis or Michael Jackson or any, any number of other hugely popular recording artists? And, and the answer is because the Beatles are more musically sophisticated. And, of course, that is opinion. I don't mean to present that as fact. Um, but uh, when you look at what the Beatles were able to do in their music, it does seem to have a greater degree of compositional sophistication than uh, their contemporaries, or I would argue, um, pop musicians before or after. So a lot of what I do, you know, every, every blog that I write, every every interview I give, every uh, book that I author, every presentation I deliver is fundamentally designed to answer that one question: Why are the Beatles so great? Why? What about the Beatles' music makes them uh, a historically important and um, so a, a lot of my job then as a Beatles scholar is to take this very sophisticated music and explain it in a way that people don't need a bachelor's degree in music theory to understand do you feel that when you write and convey this this this, this massive knowledge that, that that you have to feel like you have to word it in such a way that people like me for example without a background in music can understand the more nuanced and subtle natures within the music yeah yeah it's it's so easy and oftentimes academia will reward uh reward you for being deliberately um esoteric you know using big words just for the sake of using big <laughs> words indubitably and, indubitably yeah. of course yeah <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like I, I, my background is is doing that, and you know, trying to come off sounding as you know, like smart as I can, and 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 all that. And I did that for several years, and I just got tired of it. And and that's part of the reason I embraced pop music is because uh, so much um, contemporary classical music, whatever that means, it has that kind of ego to it, that that desire to to be smarter than anybody else. And if if you don't understand my music, it's your fault. Um, and and I, I just. I got so fed up with that, I got so sick of that, that I embraced a, a style of music that is much more accessible. And that's a big reason for the, the Beatles' success, is not only are they sophisticated, but they are also extremely accessible. They're very easy to like. And so other groups, uh, Michael Jackson comes to mind. His music is just as accessible. It's just as easy to like. It's very catchy. But I don't find the same degree of musical sophistication in Michael Jackson that I do in the Beatles. Now, simple doesn't mean bad. I mean, just because Michael Jackson's music is simple doesn't mean that his music is bad. But I do find a greater depth uh, of, of, um, of, of that compositional sophistication in the Beatles than I do with someone like Michael Jackson. Well, yeah, like if I was to do a, a podcast about Michael Jackson, the musical elements, I'm probably more going to end up talking about uh, Quincy Jones, whereas mm -hmm. on a Beatles podcast, you mentioned George Martin, but he's he's never going to be in the top four, 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 four or five things you talk about when talking about their music. Cause well, I, maybe, he, maybe he should be, though, because he contributed a lot. Well, he had the classical background, which right. was kind of instrumental in in how they kind of for, uh, formalised. Uh -huh. uh, how, 
how great of an impact do you feel he had on the band when he found them? Oh yeah, I, I think uh, I think he had a tremendous impact over the course of their career. Um, and in fact, I'm I'm um, I'm doing a well, I've got a, a friend Ken Womack who's a, a, a giant Beatles scholar and author, and uh, he and I are splitting a presentation in July in New Jersey celebrating all that George Martin contributed to the band. So I'm going to be talking a lot about how George Martin contributed, uh, how he influenced and added uh, to to their songs, to their music. It's funny you should mention uh, Ken because. Um... Our mutual acquaintance Nicole has actually arranged him to come yeah. on and do um, the next proper episode, which is Venus and Mars, oh, excellent. which is an album that, that that he likes. I, I actually can't wait to have to have him on. Yeah. So Beatles fans for me, uh, that they're, they're they're almost nerdy in a sense because uh, there's yes. there's a lot of fact collecting. Uh, people want to absorb as much trivia about every song. As, right. they, as they can, you know. Oh, Hey Bulldog was the last song where they all felt happy and it was the first time when Yoko en- enter- entered the room or mm-hmm. uh, Octopus's Garden is about Ringo's trip to Tunisia. It just all, all, the, all these little stories that seem to make the songs so 3D and so yeah. tan- tangible and real. Right. Uh, but let's put some of your theory into practice then. I believe you've sure. heard a little bit of material for the I show. Have. Uh, I have. I'd like to see what you can teach me uh, a man who self-confessed would like to think that he could get 60 to 70 percent in a Beatles trivia quiz online uh, yep. what could you teach me about get back yeah well uh, I was uh, just just the other day uh, I was l- listening to sour milk sea one of George Harrison's compositions from uh, from India uh, that they they considered for the white album but eventually rejected and instead uh, George Harrison gave it to uh, Jackie Lomax. And so I was listening to, to Sour Milk Sea the other day, mm-hmm. and I'm in the chorus. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my, my notes here. The, the lyrics are, get out of Sour Milk Sea, you don't belong, get back to where you should be, find out what's going on. And, yeah, Paul, has, yeah. yep, and Paul has cited the, the inspiration for the song Get Back from the following year, 1969, as uh, the political slogan. I think, I, I forget who it was, but it, it was something... Uh, that 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 a, a politician said that that struck a chord with him, and he wrote "Get Back" around around that. But it seems to me quite likely that these lyrics that George Harrison wrote a year earlier are just as likely to have inspired "Get Back." You know, "You Don't Belong," "Get Back to Where You Should Be" is so similar to "Get Back to Where You Once Belong." So e- even if there's not necessarily a conscious um, um, inspiration on Paul's part. I, I strongly suspect that Sour Milk Sea is at least partially responsible for inspiring Get Back. Those White Album writing sessions, I mean, you could make quite the case that that is one of the most fruitful writing mm. uh, exercises, writing periods yeah. in pop in pop music history, because some of those songs would stay on the pipeline for over 10 years and appearing on albums you know, in their in their solo careers and some uh, collaborations with them years later, I, I don't think there was ever a point in at least in their careers where they were so fruitful. I mean, mm-hmm. the whole Abbey Road medley was pretty much written in India as well, wasn't it? A lot of it, yeah. Uh, there's a, a little trivia fact about Get Back that I'm not quite sure if it's true or not. I mean, I've I've seen the Let It Be documentary. It's actually my favourite Beatles film yeah. out of, out of all of them. It just edges past Hard Days Night because. Mm-hmm. Uh, being the natural depressed pessimist that I am, I like I like to see the band for, falling apart and George <laughs> being like, "Oh, would you like me to play the solo, Paul?" Like I love yeah. that stuff. Right. But I wonder. Like, I I don't know where I read this source. It, it could have been Wikipedia, so I'm not going to stand behind it. But have have you heard yeah. that Paul would look at Yoko dead in the face whenever he sang the words "Get back to where you once belong"? Have you heard anything about that? I have heard that. I can't remember, you know, which book or anything. I could find it if you if you gave me twenty minutes to go through all the books. <laughs> but I, I believe I have heard that, uh, and and that does fit with uh, with some of the animosity that you know, the interpersonal relationships uh, that were deteriorating at at that time. So I I, I would believe that. Yeah, I think. Um... Um, I I often mention on the show Macaganda, which is the kind of mass. Uh, a culture of personality that Paul seems to put out there, and yes. the, and the Yoko hate seems to have been retconned now, very much like in Stalinist Russia when people get completely cut out of photographs and stuff like that. Yeah, it'd be nice to know what really went down because there, there there's going to be so much stuff. 
very much in the same way, you know, what if Kurt Cobain had lived and stuff like that. Yeah. We're never going to know what happened in that studio, what they said to each other. And you know it would be the most candid, juicy, especially for a, 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 a gossipy little ninny like me, just to yeah. know what what went on. And it it's pretty much concrete that the death of Lennon probably is what fixed a lot of the problems within the Beatles as as a, a family really you know, they all had to come back together for this for this tragic moment I've actually mm-hmm. just been listening to um, Tug of War uh, mm-hmm. t- today and uh, I, I sat down and I listened to Here Today for the first time mm-hmm. and pff, when you compare that to Dear Friend which is kind of the the, the uh, sister song to it it just shows this, this tragic journey that Paul has gone from losing his best friend who uh, I'm reading Howard Soon's book as well I had I had him on the show uh, a, couple, a couple of months ago did you read his book uh, Fab uh, yes yeah, yeah it's on my bookshelf yep. yeah Intimate Life of Paul McCartney yes and he's very he very strongly implies that Paul wanted to play with Lennon Lennon didn't want to play with Paul and that's right. and that's just so sad really I mean one of the things that annoyed Paul the most was Lennon just said can you ring before you come over please and yeah you, <laughs> you know that just broke his heart mm. what would you say if I asked you to talk about yesterday Oh sure, yeah. Um, that's um, we, we we were talking talking earlier about uh, about how I, I try to present the sophisticated music in 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 uh, lay terms, you know, without trying to use academic vocabulary. Um, and and yesterday, uh, my my Beatles minutes. I've got these Beatles minute videos on YouTube that are, are roughly sixty second clips that look at uh, one specific aspect of any given song. That's the, anyway, uh, that's my uh, that's my second to next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But, okay. No, no, but we'll, uh, well um, carry on. Don't worry. Don't worry. Sure. <laughs> one one of one of those Beatles minutes is uh, uh, comparing uh, the use of the tone B versus B flat in Yesterday, and so the you know the technical term is chromaticism when you use the same pitch, uh, but but you know one is flat or one is sharp or one is natural. Mm-hmm. Uh, the technical term is chromaticism, and so in Yesterday, Paul will use that chromaticism as a way to. Uh, give the song its poignant nostalgic character, mm-hmm. and I do have my keyboard right here. Uh, I'm going to play just a little bit. You tell me, can you hear this? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play yesterday, and I'm going to point out every time there's a B, and I'll point out whether it's flat or natural. So here it is, as written. There's a natural, B natural. flat B flat There's a B natural B flat So there's there's this juxtaposition of flat versus natural mm-hmm. and the flats kind of provide that depressing character the the rather uh, melancholy character that mis- that uh, yesterday has, and then the naturals considerably brighten the song, and that twinge of nostalgia uh, that that the song is so famous for is a direct result of that chromaticism that Paul uses in yesterday, and that reflects the lyrics. There's this um, discrepancy in in the singer, you know, um, of of a happy time in the past that is now gone, uh, and that that. Uh, that the present is a little is, is rather sad. So the lyrics have that you know dark versus bright contrast, and Paul chooses music that reflects that by the use of of this this juxtaposition of B flat and B natural. So what if we took yesterday and made it all B flats, no B naturals at all? Here's what it would sound like. That's a rather different character. What if we did the opposite? What if we took all those B flats and made them naturals? And that's a very different character too. 
So it's it's very um, it, it's a way that Paul is able to convey that emotional character of the song and of the lyrics by combining uh, B flats and B naturals. By using that chromaticism, he's able to uh, to to express that. Uh, the the darkness and lightness that that are in conflict with one another in both the, the lyrics and in the music, and that's part of what makes yesterday such a spectacular piece of music. That was the most fun I probably ever had with a guest on the podcast. By the way, that was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I I wish I had played them a little better. I I I've played these a couple of times, but I, I'm kind of left out a few chords and all. But uh, if you want to hear it played well, go find my Beatles minute called. B flats versus B naturals in yesterday, and I play it much better. Oh, I've seen them all. Version. I've seen them all. I'm uh, I'm absolutely addicted to a Beatles minute. But um, before, oh, well, thank you very much. Before we go on to it, uh, I'll I'll put you on the spot here. Okay. I'll, I'll see if I can draw upon your uh, your vast knowledge. Is there anything you can tell me about my favorite McCartney song? Yeah, fixing a hole. Oh sure. Let me. Uh, I've, I've got my uh, complete Beatles scores right here. I don't have this one memorized, so let me just flip to the page real fast. No problem. And let me see. Ladies and gentlemen, man looks up something in book. Uh. <laughs> oh sure. This this uh, this has what's known as an augmented chord, uh, which is uh, when I was teaching ear training at Boston University as a grad student. I had a student describe the augmented chord. Uh, as the the woman is tied to the tracks, and here comes the train chord. Let me play an augmented chord for you. <laughs> so there's there's a certain tension to an augmented chord, uh, and they're they're not terribly common. They're not terribly rare. They they're, they're you can you find them every once in a while. But anyway, fixing a hole is one where you do get that augmented chord. So the first chord is an F. The second chord is a C augmented, and then the third chord goes to F minor. And so we, we have two things there. One is, is the use of an, any augmented chord always stands out as being, being kind of interesting just because they're, they're not terribly common. Second is that Paul goes from major, the first chord, to minor, the third chord. And so he's got, uh, this, this is the technical term is mode mixture. You go from, from uh, a major chord to, uh, to the, same, uh, the same letter. So it's still F, but instead of major, it's minor. And I have to say my favorite use of, of that technique, of this mode mixture that he uses on fixing a hole, my favorite use of that is the Fool on the Hill. Oh, great Because, song. and I, I'm, I'm flipping through my, uh, my sheet music right now trying to find that one. That's on page 282. Another very Paul-dominant album. Yes. Uh, the, the Magical Mystery, Mystery Tour. Do you, uh, do, you, do you prefer the EP or the version which has all the singles on side two? I have to say I prefer the English version of everything except Mystery Tour. Because when you throw in yeah. things like Hello, Goodbye, or All You Need Is Love, or I Am the Walrus, uh, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, you throw on all those and it takes, uh, you know, it, it really elevates uh, uh, that, that album. Um, in, in a way that I don't get with the original EP. Mm -hmm. Now, Walrus was on the original double EP, and that was that was an exception. But a lot of a lot of the songs in the American release were not on the English version, and that's why I prefer the American version for that one album only. You've redeemed your rubber soul comments from earlier. I must admit. <laughs> um, there's a, a fantastic post on Reddit uh, that's recently been uh, been been going around, whereby yep. they, they've um, merged the Magical Mystery Tour and Sgt. Pepper together to create two distinct albums, where because like the uh, the sessions kind of bled in into each other obviously the uh, sure. the death of brian epstein kind of cemented the, the fact that it's just kind of an, an ongoing project um and i must admit it changes everything you 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 had a pre it changed all of your preconceived notions about about those songs it's a very interesting mix uh i, I believe you can find them on uh, spotify and things like that I'd uh, I'd highly recommend it. Um, I I don't remember what they call it. I think they call it Sergeant Pepper's Magical Mystery Tour. And I'm, I'm going to look that up. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's really really fun actually. I've never heard of that before. That's new to me. I'm I'm absolutely going to go look that up. But uh, back onto the Fool on the Hill. Yes, I found the right page. So the 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 idea with fixing a hole uh, is, is mode mixture. You know, you, you F major to F minor. And in Fool on the Hill, he does the same thing. Now, in this case, it's D. We start in D major. But when we get to the refrain with the title lyrics, but the fool on the hill, we go into minor, D minor. And 
it's the same technique. So, so what Paul did in 1967 on fixing a hole, he uses the same technique with Fool on the Hill uh, it, it, later in that year, the, the latter half of 1967 on Magical Mystery Tour. But with Mystery Tour, with Fool on the Hill, he takes it a step further. Just as we saw with yesterday, that, that bright versus dark in the lyrics is represented musically by that B flat versus B natural. Mm -hmm. So too here we have uh, uh, the lyrics about uh, the, the idiot savant. You know, uh, Paul has made uh, quotes. Uh, you're never sure if the fool on the hill is, uh, is a genius or if he's just plain stupid. And so throughout the song, we get that juxtaposition uh, in the lyrics, but we also get it through this mode mixture in the lyrics. We're never sure if this song is in D major or D minor, just as we're never sure if the fool on the hill is brilliant or a fool. Obviously, the Beatles were a cover band when they were the, the Quarrymen and the Silver Beatles. Yeah. And then Paul uh, writes uh, the one after 909 and I'll Follow the Sun. And clearly those are the uh, songs and elements that have been borrowed and plucked here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of it was intuitive and how much is it a very systematic approach of uh, I have learned how to, uh, to use this modulation. I am now going to put it in a song. Yeah, I, I've often wondered that. And if I uh, if I ever have lunch with Paul, I'm going to ask him, you know, how conscious was this? Because in some cases, I think it really is uh, a conscious decision. Oftentimes, you'll see John and Paul using the same compositional technique uh, at roughly the same time. Yes, you've got and a very so, good episode about when Paul and John uh, used modulation by thirds around yes, the same date. Yeah. Yes, yeah, an another girl... Uh, goes from A major to C major, which is a modulation by third, uh, and then you're going to lose that girl, goes from E major to G major, which is also a modulation by third. And they, they wrote them within, I forget what, like a week or two of each other. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it seems, it seems um, likely that on some level this is a conscious thing. You know, Paul sees John using XYZ technique, and he says, oh, I want to use that same technique in one of my songs, or vice versa. But at the same time, I think things like this this B flat versus B natural in Yesterday, I think that's just intuitive. I think Paul is just trying to write the best music that he can. And when he finds those chords, he he kind of intuitively understands that light-dark uh, uh, contrast that I was describing. But I don't think he consciously sat down and said, I want this light-dark contrast, therefore I'm going to juxtapose B flat and B natural. I think he's just writing... Uh, he's, he's, he's just writing as he goes. He strikes a chord and he says, yeah, that feels right, without necessarily understanding uh, the, 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 the analytical reasons for why it sounds right. And frankly, that's what makes a good artist a good artist. They don't have to know why it works. They just have to know how to, to create it. They have to recognize it when they find it. Um, so I, I suspect a lot of it is conscious, but I suspect a greater proportion, a majority of the of the uh, of the techniques that they're using is more or less intuitive. Yeah, it's funny you should mention conscious and unconscious because the famous story, not sure how true it is about yesterday, is that Paul wrote scrambled eggs in in, yes. in, in, in his sleep and apparently for the next week he ran around every record shop and every music mogul asking if he had stolen this chord this uh, progression off anyone else and it turns right. out he, he hadn't. So he literally did un unconsciously probably create one of the most iconic songs of, of the Beatles era. And it's, a, and it's a big turning point, actually, because it, it is the first song where there's no other Beatle playing, isn't there? Which is kind of... Yeah. It's kind of heralding the end, really. Like, that song kind of signals that the end times, the split, the the solo work is, is on its way, really. But Yeah, it, it anticipates the solo work. So let's get on to the Beatles minute. Um, this is this is your show. This is basically how how I found you. Uh, what, oh, cool. What, what is the Beatles minute? What and what was the inception of the uh, project? What what inspired you to create it? Yeah, well, um, I, I've I've wanted to do some sort of thing on YouTube just because it it expands my potential audience. You know, doing these live shows are great, but I, I limit my audience. And uh, part of the reason, yeah, you know, as we talked earlier, is is concerns over copyright law. So I, I'm I'm very careful with these Beatles minutes to make them very short to only use uh, you know the clips that. Um, only use 
an excerpt that I need. So, for example, if I only need five seconds, it doesn't make sense for me to play the whole song. Just use the little bit that I need. Yes. And if I tried to do uh, a, a longer, if I did like an entire one of my presentations and uploaded that, you know, that that gets a little more sketchy. So I wanted to make something that was short, one, because of, of, of legal concerns, and two, because that's the kind of videos that... Uh, uh, that that people watch, you know, I, I've I've found myself, you know, people will send me a link saying in an email saying, go go watch this video, and I click on it, and it's 37 minutes long. Well, I'm not going to watch it. If it's 90 seconds long, I will sit and watch it. So I want, I deliberately wanted to create something that was short and to the point. Uh, I've long believed in the less is more philosophy. You know, just just give me give me your best stuff in as short a time, as few pages or as few seconds as possible. And my Beatles minute is very much. Uh, in that vein like without creating a, a, a hagiography of you i mean i must admit most of the episodes that especially that i've seen are handled with the ultimate brevity like you seem to be able right. to, get, to get across everything you need to know about this one minute particular detail of a song yeah and it gets across perfectly um, i think my favorite episode is where you talk about the cut in strawberry fields yes. forever that's a right. really fascinating one. That is, you have to speed one up, you have to slow one down, and it's just yeah. a bit where you go. And the cut is now. And yes. I can't listen to the song the same way again. Now I can't. Well, listen once, to it the once same like, way. like Revolver, you said earlier. Once you once you hear Revolver, you can't unhear it. I mean, it changes. You you you, you can't ever go back to the way things were once you once you hear that. Yes, it's mm. it's like when you first hear the rumor that "Baby, You're a Rich Man" too. There's a Baby, you're a rich fag Jew is hidden within yes. there apparently somewhere, and it's like, oh, John, don't ruin the song for me, John, please. <laughs> well, it's it's the kind of stuff that that uh, I, I I haven't actually studied that song to the same extent, but on Good Morning, Good Morning, uh, at the end they sing Guten Morgen, yes. you know, German in, instead of, and and you know I never noticed it, but it's the same thing. Once once I once I found that uh, there was a YouTube clip that that pointed that out to me. And I had never thought of that before. And I went back and listened, and now I can never hear it the original way. I always hear Guten Morgen. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's similar to, to what you're describing. There's a horribly defunct and unnecessary site called Beatlesmistakes.com or something like that. And it, yeah. talks, and it talks about how all the mistakes in the songs. And mm -hmm. almost every single one of them is, is clearly intentional by the band. Like, you know, uh, uh, in Maxwell Silverhammer, uh, John famously mooned himself in the studio. And you hear yeah. Paul chuckle, like, halfway through. That's that's, right. that's not a mistake. They're not they're not stupid. <laughs> they they, right, they right. know how to how to, how to make an album. And I love all of those little those little subtle things where you, where where, where, you, where you go back. Oh, hang on, what, what was that? Like a uh, in girl, they're just saying the word tit over over and over yes. again just to get or, it. Uh, uh, the um, uh, hey Jude, you know, Paul supposedly drops an f bomb in hey Jude, and I, I don't know. I've I've listened to it and it's pretty muffled, but I yes. maybe the best one is actually on his. Uh, second album with Wings, uh, Red Rose Speedway on the yeah. song um, Get On The Right Thing you can, you can hear him shout, my plug came out I guess. Yeah. it's just randomly in the, in the background uh, obviously the most iconic one, uh, once again a lot of the iconic stuff does fall to Ringo uh, I've got blisters on my on my fingers that's, sure, probably, yeah. that's probably the biggest one um, or uh, cranberry sauce and strawberry fields that was misheard as I Buried Paul I do hear it as I Buried Paul it's it, it, yeah, if if you listen to the the original, you know, like like I like I I said in that Beatles minute, they had to slow down the tape to match, uh, to 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 match the to to make the edit work. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the non slowed down version, he does very clearly say cranberry sauce. But if you listen to the the finished, you know, the released version that is slowed down, it really does sound like he's saying I buried Paul. Oh, so it, it really depends on which one you're listening to. Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> I remember being. Uh, a little bit sozzled, shall we say? I've had I, I had a few sherries, and I was uh, on, yeah. on on the way back home. Uh, this is when I lived in Birmingham, not Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Birmingham, no, no. U, uh, Birmingham, UK, and I just I'd listened to it a day in the life, and I and I was nodding off. And you know, uh -huh. the, you know, there's that bit where it's just silence, and then it gets to the bit that loops. Yes. He goes, Never to see any other way. I right, yeah. I remember absolutely freaking out I, 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 I'd, ne I'd never touched drugs uh, anything yeah. but I thought I thought my, my reality was collapsing it was the most uh -huh. terrifying experience of my life uh, in the research you've been doing on the Beals have you found that they they can seemingly operate entirely beyond the realm of their peers like how how did they seem to do that was it a systematic approach or was it just 
innate within them, do you feel? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's also a difficult question to answer because I have no doubt that it's both. The question is to what extent. Uh, it's uh, well, it's nature versus nurture, isn't it? Nature versus nurture, exactly. Um, and and this too gets back to George Martin because I think he really pushed them. I mean, the Beatles pushed themselves in a way that few artists do, but I think George Martin also pushed them to constantly come up with with new things and new ideas and and experimental and innovative recording techniques and. Uh, and songwriting techniques. Um, so I, I, I think a lot of it is consciously trying to do something different, uh, and and it's it's a little counterintuitive. You know, if you're if you're a recording superstar, and if you found success with a certain style or or technique or whatever the case is, it only makes sense for you to want to continue uh, that that style or that technique so that you can have sustained success. But the Beatles didn't do that. They constantly reinvented themselves in a way that very few uh, very few artists do. Uh, and I think that's a really big reason why they're as popular 50 years later um, as they are. Well, you can see that model for success in their own respective careers. Um, Lennon mm -hmm. had two very good, similar albums that came out, uh, Plastic Owner Band and Imagine, and then really didn't shake things up enough or in a inventive enough way and he kind of went downhill before double fancy kind of picked <laughs> things back up in a, at, at, at an awfully yeah. poignant time harrison ooh, it's uh it's it's not the same fun journey that you have when you go through paul and wings and then paul again it, uh -huh. he, he does seem very uh stuck in his own head that oh, I, I, I just play guitar and he 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 doesn't seem to have that that breadth that would allow Paul to to cover so many areas in his own mm. way. Um, well, Paul was more wide ranging stylistically than than any of the others. That's mm -hmm. for sure, especially on the White Album. Oh, oh yeah. Well, if you look at Honey Pie to Hel to Helter Skelter, I mean, what? Yeah. What a jump. Yeah, you you can't get much further apart. You know. It has the one of the most stark cuts on on any Beatles record. When you go from Revolution Nine to Good Night as well, that's it's yeah. it's it's an album of 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 disparagement, really, isn't it? Mm. Uh, this is a question I, I'm in, I'm interested to ask okay. you. Um, there's a, a book about songwriting that uh, a friend of mine, uh, the uh, co-host of my Tom Waits podcast, uh, read some time ago, and it was uh, yeah. He he was telling me about how uh, Paul Simon had an encounter with Paul McCartney, whereby they'd be listening to the radio in the car. And Paul mm -hmm. would just be inventing new melodies and counter melodies and harmonies, seemingly like on the spot via this mm -hmm. kind of up, like to use your word, savant genius. And it really makes you wonder if there is this like prehensile meta talent that the others just didn't. And I, are, are you ever concerned or have to take into account when you're writing your books that there's quite a common deification of the Beatles, especially you know, yeah. their contributions to music, songwriting, and culture. Yeah, I, I think there is. Um, in in one of my talks, I, I describe uh, the the band's maturation. In fact, one of the Beatles Minute videos describes Paul's maturation. Um, but uh, the the idea is, look at this early uh, you know song or this early lyric, and see you know then look at one of one of their later songs or later lyrics, and and look at how much more mature. Uh, this is and and at one point I say you know that it doesn't mean that these early lyrics are 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 bad lyrics. It just means that that they're that they're young, that they're immature. And sometimes I feel my audience recoil, saying like, "How dare you criticize the Beatles because you know they because they are deified." And you know my my job, I call myself a scholar because I try not to be sucked into the to that more emotional um, you know side of things and and the the personal. Uh, connections now. Of course, I love this music. I wouldn't dedicate my entire career and life to them if I didn't. <laughs> but I, I try to be a little more objective, um, and and that's how I, I, uh, I that's how I find a lot of the the nuggets that I find is is by being objective by by trying to find the weaknesses along with the strengths, well, and that way you you see very clearly their development, the maturation, the evolution over time, where they go from juvenilia to full maturity. Uh, last question specifically on the Beatles. Um, sure. Where do you feel is the biggest musical leap between any two Beatles albums? Hmm, biggest leap. Greatest progression, I'm... maturation, progression. Yeah, I I think I would probably have to say uh, between Beatles for Sale and Rubber Soul. 
Um, you know, the, the two we talked about earlier, just, uh, I, I really like Beatles for Sale. I think that's an important uh, uh, album. But in terms of their development, uh, you know, Rubber Soul is, is so far ahead uh, of, of, uh, of Beatles for Sale. So there, there again, there's a difference between objective Aaron and uh, subjective Aaron. Because subjectively, I'm not all that fond of Rubber Soul, even though I love uh, a lot of the tracks as an album. I, I'm, I, it's never been one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, so, so subjectively, e even though I'm not a big fan of Rubber Soul, I can still objectively see how big of a step they took for, uh, forward between those two albums. Yes. And just how much pot they probably smoked. <laughs> it's uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it yeah, is, there's it, that. Too. It, it is the ultimate stoner album, in, in, <laughs> in my opinion. Not that I endorse any of that on this show. Um, right. Not of course. Of uh, of course I, not. Um, I, I always joke that that's one aspect of Beatles research I have not uh, explored yet. No. Um, like uh, from from what I've been told from from her colleagues, uh, you can't you can't try acid uh, for a day. You need to, you need to make sure you've you've uh, booked a week off. Just, just you got to commit to it. Yes. Um, yeah, that's not going. That's that that is on my bucket list to listen through Revolver all the way to Magical Mis 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 Mystery Tour whilst on some sort of other plane of existence. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, you, uh, removing drugs from the question is rather risky because um, something I, I hear a lot from, especially older Beatles fans, people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, oh, yeah. uh, I, I like it just before Revolver, before they right. really before they really got, got into the drugs. And it seems the right. youth culture really adopts uh, Revolver through to, say, uh, Yellow Submarine kind of era. And then Let It Be and Abbey Road kind of becomes a bit more commercial again, in a good way. Obviously, um, Let It Be is yeah. about getting, getting back to the basics. And then right. Ab Ab Abbey Road is this... Uh, uh, knowing last hurrah, where they just it it, it probably is the most crowd pleasing of all of all the albums. But mm. do, do, do you think the the influence of drugs and I've asked this before on the show is uh -huh. is tantamount to their to their progression? Could they have seen these things in 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 different lights, or do you really feel that it just had to have happened that 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 that, that way? You know, did they have to do it? Right. Yeah, that's it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting idea. You know, how much did drugs influence their their? You know, would they have come up with the same stuff had they not had they been sober? And because uh, I, th I think there, it's fair to say that there is an influence. Like you can't say there is. Well, absolutely, no there's an influence, no doubt about that. But like, to what extent is 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 more debatable? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote from, I think it was in Q magazine. I believe. Uh, I think it was. Their June 2004 issue, if I remember right, where Paul said it's easy to overestimate the influence of drugs on the Beatles' music, and I think he's he's pretty accurate in saying that. I mean, no doubt drugs did influence. You know, he called um, uh, which one was it? Was it? Uh, it was fixing a hole. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I think, he called an ode to pot, or maybe it was got to get you into my life. I forget one of them. Oh, he's he called, got to get you in, in, into my life. Fixing a is hole. That, okay. is, fixing a hole is the one that people thinks about heroin. Uh, right, but it's not. Yeah. It's like sometimes it's just about fixing a hole, you know. Just be, be. right. <laughs> so, but um, I, but which whichever song, it, regardless of which song, Paul Paul is clearly um, thanking uh, marijuana for helping him think differently and th and you know, think outside the box to use a very inside the box phrase. And um, so, no doubt, drugs influence the Beatles' music. But I think Paul is also accurate when he says it's easy to overestimate. And I think the strongest evidence supporting that is think of how many other people have indulged in similar substances and not been able to create anything uh, you know, worthwhile, anything that we're still talking about 50 years later. Yeah. So the Beatles are first and foremost spectacular musicians, and no amount of drugs could ever compensate for a lack of musical uh, ability or, or skill so uh, yes drugs influence you know they they, they maybe made, maybe they made john and paul uh think along different lines you know think a little bit differently than they would have had they not indulged in those substances but at the same time i do think paul is accurate when he says it's easy to overestimate i've always seen paul as the um one of the, for lack of a better phrase, least druggy of the group. Obviously, yes. Lennon seems to be the uh, the poster boy. George kind of fell out of it, 
um, yeah. after the death of the hippie in the 70s. But when you go onto albums like Ram, it's such an acid album. Like some of the, mm. some of the soundscapes are terrifying. Mon- Monkberry Moon Delight is just <laughs> that could be his his ode to acid in a way. And Interesting. that uh, brings me on to my next point. Really, uh, we've talked a lot about the Beatles here today, just like I thought we would. However, yep. this is a Paul McCartney podcast at the end of the day. Right. I do need to divert the course of the ship a little bit just to focus on the cute one. Sure, yeah. Now, when you look at the legacies of John and George Har- uh, John Lennon and George Harrison, not John and George Harrison, uh, they always seem to have a bit more credibility than McCartney. And now whether this is because they had simply died earlier and therefore hadn't even had the opportunity to make as many misfires as Paul, uh, huh. or whether there's a growing McCartney apathy just because he's still around... Uh, either one of those is kind of relevant, as I feel that it's a woefully misjudged assessment of the three as writers. Because I mean, mm. when, you, when you look at the big songs, if you have, if you go up to people on the street, what are the big Beatles songs? They're almost always going to say, "Hey Jude," "Let It Be," and "Yesterday." Uh, maybe yes. even El, maybe right. even Eleanor Rigby. Now, yeah. some people might say, "Here comes the sun," but uh-huh. no one's saying that. Oh, oh yeah, the inner light. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Old Brown Shoe, yes, that's one of the classic Beatles Be- Beatles right. tunes. The big hitters, the big singles, always did seem to be Paul. But despite this, he always seems to be left by the wayside. So I wonder if this runs any deeper than on the surface level, and you'd be the perfect person to ask this. Again, are well, Paul's musical contributions to the Beatles any less complex than his peers? I, I I wouldn't say they're less complex. I would say they're complex. They're they're just as complex, but in different ways. So, for example, Lennon seems to be more lyric oriented than Paul is. That's why Paul can sing na 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 at the chorus of at the coda of Hey Jude, or you know do 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 on uh, Mother Nature's Son. Yeah. He doesn't need lyrics because the music is more important than the lyrics. Now, conversely, when Lennon does a song like Come Together, the lyrics are far more important than the melody. The melody is just three notes. It's just those three notes over and over again, because the music isn't what's important. The, the melody is the vehicle for the delivery of the lyrics. And the surreal character of the lyrics, like Here Come Old Flat Top and Juju Eyeball, is what really... Uh, makes the song. Now, that's not to say the melody is unimportant for John Lennon. Of course it's important, just as lyrics are important for Paul. It's just to say there's a hierarchy mm-hmm. where for Lennon, the lyrics are more important than the music, and for Paul, the music is more important than the lyrics. That, of course, too, is overly simplified. There are exceptions, but in general, more often than not, uh, that is true. All of which is to say, I, I don't think Paul's songs are any Uh, less sophisticated. I just think they're sophisticated in different ways than John Lennon or George Harrison's songs were. So would you agree that with the common parlance statement that Paul McCartney, for better or worse, was the melody maker rather than the master songwriter? Well, I mean, I mean, a master songwriter can be a, a good melody you know, maker as well. I, I'm not sure I would um, make a distinction. L- there, but... Okay, uh, lyricist, sorry then. I, a lyricist, I would have to agree with. I, I, Lennon's, Lennon's, um, Lennon, when he cites inspiration, is generally uh, lyrical in, uh, in in nature. For example, in the Playboy interview, right before he died in December of 1980, uh, he cites uh, the Disney cartoon Snow White, the song "I'm Wishing." Uh, and uh, it, it's you know, want to know a secret? Promise not to tell. We are standing by a wishing well. And so he turns that into uh, the the, um, uh, the song. I'm blanking on which one it is. Do you is. want to know a secret? Yes, that's the one. I was thinking of uh, something else, but yes, that's the one I'm thinking of. Uh, you know, do you want to know a secret? Um, um, it, it, not to tell. Do yes. Da, da. Yeah. Yes, that's the one. I, I'm blanking for a second there, but that's the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> anyway, uh, he he cites the lyrics. Uh, there's no musical similarity between I'm wishing and do you want to know a secret. But the, the, what, what sparked Lennon's imagination were the lyrics. And, and that's in general true for, for John in a way that it is not true for, for Paul. For Paul, it tends to be uh, specifically musical characteristics. And I need to give a shout out uh, to, to my friend Matt Blick. Do you know Matt Blick of the Beatles Songwriting Academy? Uh, no, but you'll have to give me some links for that, definitely. 
Yes, because he did a podcast, a spectacularly well-done podcast, in which he goes into uh, a lot of detail about just this, how Lenin is, is more lyrical uh, and Paul is, is more you know, melodic or musically oriented. Uh, and, and he goes into it a, a lot more depth than, than, than I can. I, uh, but I, you, you should, everybody listening to this should, should totally go and find Matt Blake's Beatles Songwriting Academy podcast and find the one where he, he discusses Lennon and McCartney and the differences between the two because it's, uh, it's spectacularly well done. Oh, well, I'm going to check that out now. Um, I've, uh, I'm diving into about five or six Beatles, Beatles podcasts now. Um, yeah. are, are you actually into any, any uh, but why, why do Beatles media at the moment, YouTube channels, other podcasts, anything like that? Well, I, I have to say, since finding Matt Blick's uh, uh, podcast, his his is my my new favorite Beatles uh, podcast. But I I regularly regularly listen to others as well. Uh, Things we said today mm-hmm. is one that I've listened to. Um, um, uh, Robert Rodriguez's uh, something about the Beatles. I listen to that one uh, regularly. You were, um, you were appeared on that one as well, didn't you? Uh, no, I didn't. No, um, have you appeared on? No, I'm sure there's another. Is it I've Got a Beatles podcast? Oh, I've Got a Beatles podcast. That's Dave Thurmeyer, who's actually editing uh, my, my next book for me. Oh, uh, so, so that was one of the first interviews I did, was right after I published The Beatles in the Avant-Garde. I was on uh, um, Dave's I've Got a Beatles podcast. Um, so I, I, I've listened to that one many times. So yeah, there, there's there's no shortage of Beatles podcasts out there to no, uh, to indulge in. Well, very much in the, in the way that you wrote, wrote, wrote your books based on the... Uh, on the spare material available, uh, that's why I chose to do a Paul McCartney one. Uh, yeah. It wasn't until I'd got my third episode out that I realised two other people started around the same time yes. as me as well, which is how right. it always goes. We, we, right. had, we had a rival uh, Tom Waits podcast that we uh, fortunately crushed into the dust, uh, which was a very <laughs> sa- satisfying feeling. Going on to your book, uh, The Beatles and the Avant-Garde, you cite Paul sure. as being the original avant-garde Beatle. I do, yes. Uh, so what sort of influences on the band's sound or aesthetic did Paul's interest in the avant-garde ultimately bring? Yeah, that's it, it's um, it, when you think of the Beatles and the avant-garde, everyone thinks of, of John and his experiments with Yoko, like Revolution 9 and Two Virgins and uh, Life with the Lions, the wedding album, the bed ends, all of that stuff, because John and Yoko shouted it you know, from, uh, from the mountaintop in a way that Paul didn't. And part of the reason Paul isn't thought of as the avant-garde Beatle is because he he uh, would would do these aesthetic experiments for his own benefit. He wouldn't try and publish them, uh, or or put them into you know uh, finished you know, albums or recordings. Mm-hmm. There are, however, a couple of exceptions. Tomorrow Never Knows uh, uses the tape loops that he had been experimenting with. Mm-hmm. So all those weird sound effects are are uh, largely Paul's doing. And then uh, the second obvious one is A Day in the Life, the orchestral sound mass. Uh, that that you get at the the very end and right before Paul's Bridge uh, is is uh, largely his idea and he actually conducted the orchestra uh, when they they recorded that uh, for at least a couple of the takes and yes. I think George Martin recorded uh, um, did uh, you know Paul did a couple and George Martin did the the rest of the takes but uh, that's that's really Paul pushing for that kind of aesthetic experimentation in the mid 60s 66 and 67 uh and then carnival of light which has still not been released was in just, january of that year just about uh, to ask you about that was that essentially yeah. paul's own revolution nine uh it, it's it, it's it's it, that's a little oversimplified, but okay. yes, what Revolution 9 is to john lennon carnival of light is to paul mccartney um now that being said i haven't heard carnival of light because it's not been released there are all sorts of fake uh, Carnival of Lights on YouTube, but there are so not, many. Uh, there are so yeah. many. It's so annoying. Uh, so the best I can do is cite things like Barry Miles' book, Many Years from Now, uh, in which he describes it. Uh, Mark Lewison's books uh, describe it a, a little bit, um, but un- until it's until it's released, we can't really make a comparison because we we just don't know what we're dealing with. So hopefully that will be released in the near future. At some point it will be, but it, it might be decades still before. Uh, the the legal logistics are are, are all worked out, uh, but anyway, there there are are two uh, officially released Beatles songs that feature Paul's uh, avant garde ideas, and uh, one in Carnival of Light that has to be one of the the Beatles bootleg uh, Holy Grails that has yet yes. to be written. It's probably in some vault or a, a salt mine somewhere. Just somewhere, yeah. Out. I mean, um, when uh, Paul and George were doing the anthology. They uh, thought that their 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 next project would just be called "Scraping the Barrel," 
because that's pretty yeah. much all all that would all, all that would would be left. But there are actually right. some uh, some very good alternative takes on the uh, anthology stuff. Um, takes like uh, Strawberry Fields Forever, but uh, a lot like a uh, Mean Mr. Mustard has a wonderful alternate take. Same with yeah. uh, Rock, Rocky Raccoon and uh, stuff like that. True. Have you noticed any other songwriting tricks that Paul McCartney regularly employs in his music, at least with the Beatles? Sure. Yeah. Let me. Uh... I, I was I was making a list uh, yesterday to, to to make sure that I have uh, have some ideas. Let me look at this real fast. Oh, here we go. So Penny Lane, one of his most famous. And I've, I've got a Beatles Minute video on this one too, but I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate on my little keyboard. Uh, Penny Lane has two different keys. Uh, we have A major for the uh, choruses, and we have B major for the verses. And I have to admit, this is one that I didn't prepare, so I'm going to try and play it, but I'm not sure how it's going to go. You we'll might have to it. edit this out of the show. We'll wing it. Uh, uh, I don't know, something, something. Anyway, that's the, that's the verse, and we're in B major for the verse. Then when we get to the chorus, uh, we, we change keys. We go from B to A major. So there we are in A major. And why does Paul do this? Well, two reasons. One is because he used the exact same technique a year earlier on Good Day Sunshine, and curiously, John Lennon used the same technique that's uh, on um, Dr. Robert. Mm. So they, they had used this idea, A juxtaposed against B, uh, uh, before, but on Penny Lane he takes it a step further, and that is to assign lyrical characteristics to each of these two different tonalities. So when Paul's doing the verses, uh, he's singing about the past, all of the imagery, the banker, uh, you know, the pretty nurse selling poppies from a tray, uh, you know, the the firemen rushing in. All of that is imagery from the past. Those are things that Paul saw as a youth when he was in. Uh, Penny Lane, when he would pass through uh, uh, Penny Lane, and he's resurrecting all of that past imagery for use in the song. When that happens, Paul sings in B major. So B major is the key of the past. But then in the chorus, uh, he he changes that. You know, Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. He's no longer reminiscing. He's no longer thinking about the past. He's in the present, the here and now. And so there's a temporal change in the lyrics that is reinforced by a tonal change in the music. So A major is the key of the present, B major is the key of the past. And that, uh, I, I do have to say, that idea is not original with me. Other people have thought of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's, what's, what I find, uh, uh, what, what, what is original, uh, or at least um, independent, I came up with independently, is how Paul does that after using the same technique uh, the year prior on, on with John on Dr. Robert and Paul on Good Day Sunshine. So once again, it's it's that idea of progression, of maturation. We see an early song that the Beatles do, and then we see a later song that does something similar but takes it that next step, and it gives Penny Lane more depth than either of its predecessors, Good Day Sunshine or Dr. Robert had. My favorite one uh, that, 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 that you do, uh, it, was, it was a spooky Beatles minute, um, the Ghost of Eleanor Rigby. Oh yes, oh. I think that's my favorite of all the Beatles minutes I've done. I think that's my favorite. Like if if you wanted to show off to someone, this is the this is the this is what I do. I I analyze Beatles stuff. Yeah, that's that's, that's the one to use because it's that's the one to use. Yeah, yeah it's just I'm, I'm I'm gonna put a link to that one specifically sure. in this podcast because I, I don't want to spoil it to anyone now. But, oh okay. But but let's but let's just say uh, again I can't look at the song in the same way. And the way right. you describe it really brought the song to life for me. Okay, uh, I I could play it. I mean, on the, you know the keyboard, I could play it, or or we can save it and, and make people go to YouTube. Yes, we are a plug. It's a plug. It's a business. It's a plug. Okay, we're, we're a businessman here. Very good. <laughs> what makes Paul distinctive as a bass player? Oh sure, his uh, his bass lines are so mellifluous, so melodic, and so smooth. And uh, th this, again, gets back to, you know, look at an early song like uh, She Loves You. So the bass line on She Loves You, I'm, I need to look at my music. Just give me a second. This is page 868. I wish I had this all memorized, but I don't. 
I, I once tried to memorize the lyrics to a Zilib dick, but I gave up after about yeah. five five minutes. <laughs> I was, right. I'm terrible at German. I'm absolutely terrible. So here's Paul's bass line. Uh, <laughs> So that fits over the you know the opening chords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, yeah, okay. This is one I also didn't practice, which is why I'm strong. Anyway, but so that's over. You know, uh, uh, where is it? Where here it is. Uh, uh, anyway, anyway, you get the idea. I'm not a great pianist, but uh, so. Uh, Paul's bass line is, is pretty pretty tame, or, or something to that effect. And he, he tends to use one or two notes per chord. So that opening chord is E minor, and Paul uses E, and he uses B, and occasionally will throw in a D. <laughs> and then when the chord changes, he'll change his notes, and that's that's pretty standard. It's it's pretty simple. That's not to say it's bad. It works perfectly fine, but it's an example of immature Paul bass playing because he's only it, it, he's using formulaic patterns as opposed to a song uh, like Come Together. Right, that's all one chord. That's a D minor chord, but he's using one, two, three, four, five. Uh, five different notes, and it's much more melodic uh, than See, She Loves You. And, and there, too, we see that evolution. We see Paul as a relatively young bass player in a song like She Loves You from 63. Mm -hmm. And then as time progresses, as he becomes more uh, competent and sophisticated, not to say that he wasn't competent before, but as he becomes more sophisticated, we see much more melodic bass playing that in many ways mimics his sense of melodicism as a composer. So, for example, Hey Jude, that span, the lowest note is a D, the highest note is an E, a uh, nine tones above, and that's a very, a rather, rather wide-ranging. That's hard to say. Melody, and the same thing with the bass line. That's ten notes between the low D and the high F sharp. So just as his melodic, uh, as his melodies are wide-ranging, so too as Paul develops as a bass player, his bass playing starts to mimic his sense of. Uh, of 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 melody, mm -hmm. and of course, in "She Loves You," as I played, and uh, in, in "Come Together," as I played earlier, the melody that that John came up with is quite compact. It's just four notes from the low C to the high F. So Paul's bass line, spanning ten notes, is two and a half times more melodic, more wide ranging mm -hmm. than John's melody. And, and that's, uh, so Come Together is probably his most famous bass line. I also have a Beatles minute about, um, uh, with a little help from my friends and the, the melodic playing, uh, bass playing there. I've got one on Rain and Paperback Writer. And Rain's Paul's one of his best. Oh. Oh, it's, it's absolutely spectacular. So anyway, um, I'm kind of rambling there. But that, that uh, gets, gets back to you know, Paul's development as a bass player from those early formulaic patterns in, in their early years to these very wide-ranging melodies that are hummable in their own right in the, the latter part of the decade. I'd probably go hands down saying Hey Bulldog's probably my favorite Paul McCartney bass line, just, just to mention because it goes mad. Yeah. And just like when Harrison does his solo... I don't listen to Harrison's part. I'm listening to what Paul's doing in the background, which is just as complex, just yeah. as interesting. Sure. It's so fast. It's like, wow, I really didn't know Paul Paul, Paul could play this way. And he does. Right. And it's so, not shocking, but it's it's it, it's surprising in a very in a very positive way. Um, I remember li uh, liking very much uh, another uh, Beatles Minute episode uh, uh -huh. about Paul using a slightly altered version of... Um, I don't know whether it was the guitar chords or the, or the bass line for When the Saints Go Marching In. Oh, yeah, yeah. And how we used it on I Saw Her Standing There. And one of my right. favorite favorite things to do now is to uh, p pretend that nugget of information is something that I've come up with and, <laughs> and, and uh, go, go up to people and get them to sing I, uh, When the Saints Go Marching In and I Saw Her Standing There, very much like, 
like you do in the video. And it, well, it, I, it, it I have works. to admit, it's not original with me either. Ah, I, I, no. Someone else pointed that out to me. I, I put together uh, the Beatles minute to show simultaneously, you know, to play when yeah. the Saints and Saar are standing there at the same time to a, really show that. But the idea is it, yeah. It's a, a one note difference, isn't it? Something like that. It, it's something I forget offhand, but yeah, it's it's very very similar. What makes Paul's granny music? tracks or his granny shit as uh john would call it what right. makes them so drastically different from all other beatles songs yeah it's it's um it's it's i i was just listening to thingamabob the the brass band piece that paul composed in i think it was 67 for uh the black dyke mills band uh to record and it's it's very peppy uh let me see it's uh <laughs> So that's the the melody to the the verses of, uh, of of Thingamabob, and it's got that same kind of granny music character, mm -hmm. and 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 to I, I don't want to get overly technical, but the 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 way he uses the chord progressions uh, are are very reminiscent of uh, of that style of music, and, and um, and and so a song like Thingamabob or Honey Pie. Uh, or uh, Maxwell's Silver Hammer uh, will often use uh, uh, chord progressions that, that are are representative, characteristic, and defining of that that kind of granny, you know, dance hall uh, brass band style of music. So um, I don't I don't know if I'm actually answering your question, <laughs> but um, he 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 won't he wouldn't use those same chord progressions in uh, a song like. Um, you know, with a little help from my friends, yeah. uses uses very different sense of harmony, different chords, <clears throat> different um, you know, cer certain chords will lead to other chords as opposed to the kind that he would use in Honey Pie. Well, um, one of the things that, like with books like uh, Revolution in the Head or Beatles Songs, those those sure. kind of, uh, pub uh, publications, there's like a little percentage meter. Uh, Lennon wrote sixty eight right. percent of this track, and yeah. Ringo wrote two percent. Uh, I, I think that was like uh, what goes on. Like there was a little Ringo five or ten percent in there somewhere. Right. But uh, do, do you feel like, um, especially around the top of the White Album and stuff like that, like these Granny Music songs, do they still feel like Beatles songs to you, or does it just feel like? Uh, McCartney one uh, b uh, beta mode, you know, it's kind of just pre solo Paul. Yeah, it's it's uh, that you you can kind of tell that it's Paul. I mean, there there are certain characteristics. You know, as, as I was describing Thingamabob and, and uh, these these certain chord progressions, mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking to myself, well, now wait a minute, there are all these other Beatles songs that use similar chord progressions. So there's it's it's. Um, it, it's it's difficult to answer. There's no easy answer there. There are certain things. So, for example, Thingamabob. That's a B, B flat major to a G. To a G7. B flat major to G7. And that, that is, it, it's what's known as a common tone chord because the note D is common to both B flat and to G. So it's, it's called a common tone chord progression, and Paul loves common tone chord progressions. So while it is true that there are certain progressions that Paul will use in his granny music to give it that granny music flavor, at the same time, there are chord progressions that are strongly representative of his quote-unquote normal uh, you know, Beatles songs, the non-granny music stuff. Mm -hmm. So... It, this I'm, I'm hesitant to answer you know one way or the other because as soon as i say something of course there's going to be an exception to that um all of which i guess is to say even though this is paul's granny music style there are still trademarks that that define this you know that that there are still mccartney fingerprints all over uh the the granny music stuff that he that he uh produced yeah uh there's a, a brilliant quote from denny lane which kind of sums that up it's just it's very hard to keep paul out of the song in that in that way he's always gonna yeah. slowly worm something in especially since he's such a, a a headstrong man anyway uh now before we come to the conclusion um mm -hmm. i'm not sure how much of a solo mccartney man you are i don't know if you if, if you know your flaming pies from your tug of wars but um, I'm not not really i mean i've listened to them and, and, and all but i haven't digested them the way i have the beatles catalog so whilst these songs are still in your stomach have you seen any differences in the way Paul might write songs as a Beatle and the way Paul might write songs just as Paul? 
That's that's a really interesting idea. I have to admit, I, I don't know the solo stuff well enough to be able to say either way. Um, and part of the reason is just there's so much, you know, the Beatles' output is so rich and so dense that at this point, I'm still relatively new to this. I've been doing this full-time for about a year and a half and part-time for a couple years before that. So I'm still relatively new uh, to, to, to this kind of study. And at this point, uh, I haven't felt the need to expand my scope so right now I'm really looking at the Beatles, you know, between 1960 and 1970, uh, and and what they were able to do and and record and produce. At some point, I probably will get to this um, to this kind of saturation point where I want to start looking at other artists and into the solo careers. Uh, but at, at at this point, because I'm still relatively new to this, I haven't felt that need yet. So I've put almost all of my energies and time into analyzing the Beatles catalog in particular, and consequently I haven't really studied the solo careers or other artists anywhere near to the same extent. That's a very long way of saying I don't know how to answer your question. <laughs> well, um, it's funny you should say like you're, you're not an expert in it either. I'm definitely not. Um, with my Tom Waits podcast, the thing was me and my friend, we knew his discography back to front. When mm -hmm. I started the show, I pretty much knew McCartney 1, Ram, and Band on the Run. In, uh -huh. in the most broad pop uh, pop culture sense, and yeah. uh, when I do the next episode with uh, Dr. Ken, yep. that's my that's the first time that I've never listened to prior to starting the show. So this is, you know, uncharted territory for me as well. Mm. Um, but one of the things I like to do is spot a Beatles song, and you can spot them a mile off whenever whenever Paul Paul does it. Um, and the most glaring example, um, you may you may have heard it. It's off uh, Wings' first album, Wildlife. Uh, uh -huh. Check it out. It's called a song called Tomorrow, and it's quite clearly a Beatles reject song in the best possible way. I don't think it was ever written right. during, during the time, but the way the song goes, the way he rhymes things, like um, one of the things I love is whenever you hear Paul say a word like tomorrow, for for example, you have yeah. that thing and we go, okay, it, uh, follow or sorrow's gonna gonna come next. You just you you have that innate feeling again he's not the master ly uh, ly 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 lyricist and he can get into kind of mawkish hokiness with his rhyming sometimes schemes. silly love songs uh, but but what's wrong with that <laughs> well yeah that's that's what yeah. paul would say why yeah. why not what's wrong with silly love song which is um uh, again oddly a a, a a massive hit in america that was like number one for uh five weeks uh, I, I, mm. I believe i i only know that because uh right now uh my my uh, daytime job is uh, I work I work in a hotel, uh, okay. And I've I've been doing the night shift, and it, I I can just read so much Beatles stuff because yeah. it's, it's just eight hours of silence. I'm like, oh, okay, I, yeah. I I can read all of Conversations with McCartney in one yes. shift. Brilliant. I I had a, a summer job. The summers of 2005 and 2006, I was employed by the Ravinia Music Festival, which is the Chicago Symphony's summer home. Okay. And so I was. Uh, <clears throat> I was just a, a low-level parking lot attendant, uh, but I had so much free time to read all sorts. So I read like uh, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. You know, that's like 1,300 pages or something because I, there was so much downtime. I, a lot of time you know, during the concert when people are parked, but before they leave, you know, there's there's not a lot to do. So I just, <laughs> I just read the whole time. Yeah, I I will always regret that I came to uh, to reading a bit a bit too late, but I am I am catching up as quick as I can. Obviously, yeah. there are a lot of other authors uh, of big Paul work that I would oh, like yeah. to to get on the show. Um, I've had uh, Luca Perezzi on. I've had Howard Soons. I've had you. Mark Lewisham is is the gold standard, like you say. Oh, he's he's the best. Yeah. Paul uh, Paul De Noye, um Barry Barry Miles as well. All, oh yeah. The, these are all names that like I've I've, I've got to get on this show. I'm, I I really do. And uh, uh, Philip Norman just came out with a biography last year. Yes. Um, yeah. He did, yeah. Oh, is that is that the big one? Just called like McCartney or something like. Uh, that? Yeah, I think it is just a McCartney a life or something yeah. something like that maybe. It, it was. I, I haven't read it yet, but uh, it's yeah. on my list. One, uh, one of my best friends works in uh, Waterstone, so he's always just sending me the art, the, the, the art text. There's another Beatles book in. I get like two a week from him. Yeah. So we're going to draw this to a, a, a close now. Um, unfortunately, uh, on, on, honestly, this what this is one of the most fun podcasts I've ever, I've, I've ever done. Oh, I've, excellent! I've, I've really enjoyed uh, talk talk with you, man. 
Um, oh, I, I could do this all day long. This is great. Oh, it's 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 not hard to talk enthusiastically about the Beatles all day. It's, right. It, it's really not. Are you working on anything right now? Anything? Yeah, I've got a couple of a uh, couple of projects. Uh, the one I mentioned, where Dave Thurmeyer of I've Got a Beatles podcast is editing, is uh, uh, is an encyclopedia of structure in Beatles songs. So it's looking at uh, you know like A A B A forms and verses and choruses and bridges and intros and codas and all all that good stuff to look at exactly how do the Beatles uh, structure their songs because you can have the best musical idea you might have a great lyric or a wonderful melody or an awesome chord progression but if you can't uh, if you can't show that in a way that makes sense to your audience then it it really doesn't matter how great your lyric or chord progression or melody is and that's really what structure is all about it's how the beatles chose to present their innovative musical ideas so that's that's my my next project i'm hoping to publish that one in may and anything uh, that you can hint us about for the future every, every time i've asked someone on the, on the show do you have a, a future project they, they say I'm not allowed to talk about it. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid because obviously the moment you talk about about a book, it's it's pretty much over. But are there any uh, future Beatles uh, book ideas you might have in the pipeline? Anything? Uh... Yeah, I'm always getting new ideas. Uh, I, I've uh, I've I've taken to uh, setting a very high bar for myself and saying, you know, I want I want to get this book done by next December or whatever the case may be. And uh, most of the time, I, I'm not able to meet that high goal, but I'd much rather have a high goal and, and see, miss yeah. the mark slightly than to aim low and, and hit the mark. So I, I always have new ideas. Uh, the program that I'm delivering this evening, we're, we're recording this January 10th, uh, and the, the, <clears throat> the program I'm giving in a couple hours in Indiana here in the States is called The Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And I want to turn that one into, uh, um, into book form, essentially transcribe. Uh, my my presentation and turn that into book form along with several other uh, presentations that I do. Uh, so I, I want to do like a compendium of maybe four different presentations uh, that that I can I can turn into to hard copy uh, instead of the the live format. So that's on that's on the agenda for uh, uh, for the next you know who knows I, I've got I got so much to do, so much to do before I can get to that, but that's on on the long term goal. I want to have that uh, in in the relatively uh, near future. Brilliant, and uh, not putting any uh, any pressure on you or anything. But if if I don't get at least three shout outs in your lecture today, I'm not going to put this podcast out. I'm just gonna huh. I'm just gonna say that right now. It's interesting you're, you're going to do um, the Stones though, because I I I always looked down on the Stones the moment I found out that their first number one. Was I want to be your man? Without first that, number one in it. England. In, in England, I, yes. Yeah, because in the states it's satisfaction. I, I mentioned that in my presentation. So, but yeah, I think in England I want to be your man. Which is uh, actually one of my favourite songs. Actually, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Ringo. Um, what goes yeah. on is is just a, a beautiful song to me. Really, uh, I always love how they kind of coddle him and they like. Okay, right. okay, Ringo, we know you've got a limited vocal range. So let's write a song with a limited vocal range, and then that's where, yeah. um, with a little help from my friends, came came from, and it works within. Like Ringo in the band is almost, almost a character, isn't he? Uh, yeah. Whereas the other ones seem to be the personalities. They Ringo soon that has been crafted and and is delivered in this beautiful way, like um, just all like Yellow Submarine, uh, with, with with a little help from from my friends. Um, yeah. He just seemed to be this kind of otherworldly figure that doesn't seem to exist within the band. And then when you get onto, like, I love Octopus's Garden, but ooh, oh yeah, don't pass me by. Ooh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a one of the. You know when um, George Martin says, "I really do think they should have cut it down to one album." Uh, yeah, I think he's talking about songs like that. I really, I really, I really yeah. do. Well, I, I I love that that quote. You know, let's let's whittle it down to a single disc, but. The the problem is nobody can agree which songs to keep and which half to get rid of. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm actually doing a a, a presentation, uh, a co-presentation with Jude Kessler, the author of the John Lennon series, in uh, in a couple of weeks down in Louisiana, in which we're going to we're going to do just that. She's going to talk about the you know the history of the White Album. I'm going to go song by song and make a case for why each of the thirty tracks should stay on the album. There's and thirty. Then, I didn't realize, I didn't realize thirty tracks. Yeah, and then uh, we're going to have the audience, uh, you know, debate and and duke it out. You know, we got to whittle this down to to just one disc, 
you know, you you guys have to decide which half we keep and which half we get rid of. I'm really looking forward to to that uh, to that program. Oh, um, okay. Are the, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw two caveats into that. One, yep. are you are you taking into account the amount of time you can fit onto? Yes. What? Well, okay, so right. so you can't just fit however many songs it has to fit onto the disc. It and, has to fit onto a disc. Yeah. And number two, are you going to put Revolution and Hey Jude in there as well? I wasn't planning on it just because we've got thirty already. Because to, to Revolution One, I'd throw that out and, and put Revolution in almost in a heartbeat. I really wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think twice about it. Also, uh, where are you broadcasting from right now? Sorry. Uh, I'm in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. So, any any chance of you coming back to the uh, the good old UK, merry old England, any 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 time soon? Because I mean, I'd I, I'd love to attend one. I really I really would. I sure hope so. I, I did my first English tour in July of 2015, right after I upped this to a, a full-time endeavor. And uh, I, I had an awful lot of fun. Uh, the, the, the real problem is it's just so expensive uh, to fly there. So I, I really hope to. Uh, and, and every August, of course, there's the, the Beatles week in, in Liverpool. And I hope to speak there at some point. It's not going to happen in 2017. But I, I really want to, to go back. I had such a great time when I was there. Uh, a couple about a year and a half ago. Oh well, I'm I'm uh, glad you enjoyed it. I, uh, I took uh, me, uh, me and my girlfriend up to Liverpool to visit the Beatles story, which is uh, one sure. of the many museums in Liverpool. Unfortunately, yes. without um, damningly faint praise, it was just one of those experiences. Where I was like, yeah, this is exactly like the eight days a week documentary. Uh, uh-huh. Great if you're a new fan, absolutely great if you're a new fan. But right. if you if one of those people who have trawled the, hi- the the history, it's uh, right. What else you got? Like it, it is nice to see George Harrison's first guitar, mm-hmm. but the way it's the way it was presented, it, it it made me very suspicious. Like, hang on, I could just touch that. There is nothing stopping me from just breaking George Harrison's right. very, very very first guitar. So I was I was very skeptical. I really I really was. Mm-hmm. But I believe I uh, not only are we out of time. I've also ran out of uh, questions without just asking you song by song what you think right. of every every Beatles song. And believe me. I really could do that. Uh, yeah. No, um, I mean, I could go on to, uh, about how I believe one after nine oh nine is nowhere near as bad as anyone says it is, or how within you without you is clearly the greatest song on Sergeant Pepper, no questions asked. But unfortunately, we've got to bring this to a close. Aaron, I've had a wonderful time on this on this podcast i've been avoiding your second name like the plague because i've already forgotten i'm terrible with names but Just call me aaron the k aaron the k okay oh um just uh just uh before i go yeah um what do you, um I, I did a, a podcast uh discussing the yellow submarine film i was just wondering if you uh will uh, keep it brief but do you have any uh-huh. thoughts on the on the yellow sub on the yellow submarine film i'd just love to hear your opinion on it yeah, actually, uh, I have a, a Beatles minute on on uh, Yellow Submarine that deals with the topic of color, because uh, one of the defining characteristics of, of psychedelia is is um, very vibrant colors, and Yellow Submarine is no exception. And um, so, um, in in the soundtrack uh, on the Beatles anthology, I think it's anthology three disc. One track one is called A Beginning, and it's it's an orchestral uh, arrangement that George Martin did originally for the White Album, but it was eventually put on uh, on Yellow Submarine instead. And it has uh, a, a, a very impressionistic character. If you if you know the music of Cloud Debussy or Maurice Ravel uh, or, or that style of music, uh, George Martin clearly modeled A Beginning after their example. And what he's doing in in using impressionistic music for the cartoon Yellow Submarine, what George Martin is doing is drawing a parallel between those two genres, late 19th, early 20th century French Impressionism and 1960s pop psychedelia, both of which thrive on color. So there's no coinc- it's no coincidence that the film is titled Yellow Submarine or that the villains of the film are the blue meanies. It's because color is integral to psychedelia just as it is to French Impressionism. And that's what George Martin is showing musically in using Impressionistic music to accompany the cartoon. It's funny you should mention color in such a way because one uh, thing that I found out from one of the hosts of the podcast that I was on is that the blue uh-huh. meanies were originally meant to be red. And there's going to be oh, almost, uh, a communist under undertone to it, which oh, interesting, which would have been fantastic to explore. And it was literally um, 
someone cocked up uh, in the uh, in the animation room, and they yeah. became and they became the the, uh, the blue meanies. And who knows? There could have been an even deeper, another Beatles. Co- you know, yet another Beatles conspiracy can be can be, huh. can be born out, 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 out of that. I mean, one of the uh, par- parallels that you didn't mention between the Beatles and John F. Kennedy is that they both have endless conspiracy theories about oh yeah about 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 their deaths I, in that uh, i had uh, i had a guy i did i did my kennedy beatles talk in madison wisconsin a few years back and i had a guy come up to me and say did you know that the same guys who assassinated kennedy are are the, also the guys who assassinated john lennon and i said oh i've never heard that theory before and he said oh no it's not theory it's fact, it's fact. <laughs> and i said okay it's facts uh, so yeah if you ever want to depress yourself just read the wikipedia entry on the uh, murder yeah. of john lennon it's it, it's just a grueling there's one quote from the nurse and it just says even if he'd been shot in the operating theater he wouldn't have lived it's like damn oh he just got absolutely destroyed but on that on that wonderful note aaron uh yeah. <laughs> i'm that happy conclusion yeah. uh, as i seem to do on on almost every episode really um, <laughs> <laughs> look it's been a wonderful show uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad I could just talk about Beatles. Uh, I've been I've been constricted by purely poor for for too long now, and I'm and, <laughs> and I'm glad I could get this out on on oh, the airways. Um, sometime in in the future, I'd love to have you back. So, oh, I, I would absolutely love that. This has been a real a real treat for me, especially now that I have to go and do another ten hour night shift as soon as <laughs> I click stop recording on this. I'm actually stalling okay. just so I don't have to go right now. Look, okay. Um, Everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, I've been Sam, he's been Aaron, and this has been Paul or Nothing. Please join in whenever I get around to releasing the next episode. Take care, Aaron. Thank you, man. Bye.